Welcome to the Dahl Global Virtual Lounge. This is the show where we discuss the future of the modern workplace and the impact of diversity, inclusion and belonging with the world's most successful and innovative leaders. Today, I am thrilled to have a wonderful panel lineup for you all. Uh, I'm joined by Paul Parker, ex-England international men's team footballer and current football and sports pundit. Stacey Copeland, professional speaker and athlete and Commonwealth title holder. And Graham Beecroft, or Beaky, uh, to, to those that know him as Beaky, a sports broadcaster, predominantly football and on TalkSport, national sports radio station. Welcome to the show, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Uh, I know it's going to be a, a really exciting conversation about a number of key topics within the world of sport and representation. And so obviously today we're going to be discussing a, a number of key elements around inclusivity and um, the agenda and, and BAME and diversity and inclusion and what really does need to be done, not only within the media, but within wider sporting organizations and before we get into the nuts and bolts of the uh, of the chat today uh, it would be fantastic just for our listeners if we could all share a little about each of uh, our respective backgrounds how we came to be where we are today and what we are working on at the moment given given the current covid crisis stacy i'm going to come to you first if that's okay yep so i started out in football and boxing when I started in football, there were very, very few opportunities uh, for girls, which progressively obviously got better and resulted in me having the opportunity to play for my country. And then I went over to America on a scholarship and then I played a little bit in Brazil and, uh, and then I finished my football career in Sweden. So I had some incredible experiences in football, but um, never quite lost that hunger and desire to pursue that boxing dream, which I did in the end. And... That resulted in um, you know, a, a silver medal at the European Championships for England and I've since turned professional and won the Commonwealth title in Zimbabwe. It was my most recent fight, uh, which was an amazing experience. So I'm really passionate about uh, my charity that I've just set up, Pave the Way, which is about paving the way, you know, gender not to be a barrier for human potential. And that, that's for both genders because I know that boys face a lot of stigma as well, but the, the premise applies for whatever aspects of our humanity uh, whether that be race, disability, class, gender, whatever it is, uh, it shouldn't be a barrier to us fulfilling our potential as gender has been for me. So that's what I'm passionate about uh, doing. And uh, that's what's filling up my time during this, uh, you know, COVID-19 pandemic, really. It's, I'm still passionate about the things I was before it and I still am now. So um, difficult to get some things done, but, uh, but still possible. Thanks so much for sharing, Stacey, and massive congratulations for Pave the Way, because I know that you're a registered charity now, which is absolutely brilliant news, brilliant news. <laughs> what is done now? <laughs> Paul? I'm obviously a, an ex-footballer, but I started off in a very, very difficult time in football in the 80s, of where the colour of your skin made it very, very difficult to move on. But it was a, it was a battle, and one of the, I weren't going to lose, didn't want to lose because the only thing in my mind was to play football, much to the disbelief of my um, career as teacher in my school, but I carried on, I had to fight battles off the pitch, fight them on the pitch, um, not so much with my teammates or people I played against, with people paying to watch the game, but you get over that, um, especially if you've got it in your mindset that what you want and where you want to be at the end, and I'm very fortunate that I cut through all that, and I was able to play for, which I still stick in mind, three great clubs in Fulham, Queen's Park Rangers and Manchester United. And every boy's dream is to play an FA Cup final, which I've done, and to represent their country, which I've done as well. But there's always an added bonus of after years of my first World Cup was 1974 that I watched as a boy. And you watch it and you just you think about playing. But the major thing of going to a World Cup is what happens that bit going into it and being in and around it, the game is an added bonus. And even better if you can go as far as possible. And I was able to do that. Still remembered, but every time it's remembered, you feel older, older. You just get older and older. And the last thing is people start putting O's at the end. And all of a sudden, it's 3 O this year, which makes me 30 years older than when I played, which is horrific. 
<laughs> well, I would have loved to have done what our two other uh, illustrious guests did and, and play sport, and particularly football, at, at the highest level. I think uh, that's anybody who goes out and kicks a ball with their mates on the field or on the street or whatever would love to do. And uh, uh, sadly, I didn't have the ability to do that. I played at an OK level, but, um, you know, never going to play, play at the level that, 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 that our other two guests have played at. And so uh, my ambition, as far as that was concerned, was curtailed. And I didn't even start out life once I left school as a, as a journalist or uh, wanting to be a journalist particularly I always felt as though I could I could broadcast on radio and commentate but in those days there were no um, university degrees which led you into that kind of thing so I just got into it purely by by luck I mean I started out as Lever Brothers in Port Sunlight who are soap manufacturers well-known international company uh, then I worked for um, uh, uh, quantity surveyor in an office in Liverpool and then went to work for civil engineers uh, in Liverpool uh, doing uh, the same sort of stuff but I got a, a lucky break in that I used to write I used to play for a Sunday league football team and I used to write a little column for our match every week which got on the back page of the, of the local paper the Birmingham News as it was and the um, uh, press officer press secretary uh, of the uh, Birkenhead Sunday league was was packing in and they asked me, because they saw my, my writing, if I could do the job. So I did. And uh, just by a series of, it was a, it was a winter's day, and no football was on on Merseyside in the Sunday League, in the Liverpool Sunday League, or, or much of the back and head Sunday League, apart from a game which I knew was going to take place, which was a good smart pitch, which was uh, owned actually by Cadbury's, lovely flat surface. And they decided to play. So the chap that did the Sunday League programme said, are you playing? Said, no, our game's off. So he said, would you like to come along with me? I met him. And from there, he said, you know, I think if you'd like to, I, I could use you. And, uh, and gradually, I, I, was, I was working there for, for four years at BBC Radio Merseyside for nothing when I eventually got a, uh, uh, an offer of a job. Or rather, I had to go before a, a board to, to get the job. But anyway, they asked me to apply. I got the job. And uh, from there I went to Radio City and then I went um, freelance and um, hit out there. Wonderful. Well, from humble seedlings do great oak trees grow. And clearly, look, you know, I, I, from the bottom of my heart, all, all three of you are just very, very inspirational individuals. All very different backgrounds and very different stories as to how you came to be where you are today. But I think a, a great testament to, to what um, modern day inclusive sport has to offer. And to this point, you know, it would be brilliant to, to kind of kickstart the conversation today with some of the observations that we've all had respectively uh, within, you know, of course, sport, but also when it comes to inclusion, because as you've all alluded, to look sport and you know, in fact business as well you know it's very very different uh, as you know young as a decade ago you know even the last couple of years I've seen legalities change around even uh, you know gender when it comes to to things such as boxing which I know Stacey you can talk a lot about um, but I wonder whether you would mind sharing some of your observations over your illustrious careers the last 10 10 20 years as to how things have changed and hopefully changed for the better Okay. With football, if we're talking about in the last 10 years or so, is that when we talk about racism, it's definitely more awareness now. There's, um, there's more groups you, that are now t have now formed. There's more places to people to go, and, to go and talk, to talk about it. And there's a lot more people out there who are willing to listen than what there was many years ago. They're willing to listen and they're willing to go and take it further because that was always a problem. There were, you know, I always found it easy to to be able to talk to people, but they couldn't go any further, and that was because it would affect them would affect them in what they was doing as well. So I could understand that I'll, it was just someone to talk to, someone maybe to maybe cry on their shoulder. Not that I did that or want to admit to doing that, but um, it was just someone just to relate to in that given time, and it wasn't asking for them to go and fight a battle for you. Now there's a lot of people who are willing to go and take that to task and go and try and get things moving on which is which is great and as I always keep saying that's the only way it can be done it's a it is a slow moving vehicle at this moment in time it can't go any quicker because life only goes only goes at one rate so things are getting easier better my biggest concern is that people just want to want to want it um, to happen now and it's never going to be that way through generations that things will change. 
Yeah, I think wise words from Paul there. I think you're absolutely right. It is going to be a generational thing. And I think, you know, attitudes at schools have changed. Uh, the way children are taught these days is, is different, that they have links with countries in, in, in other parts of the world and schools in other parts of the world. And they see uh, through that sort of window, um, you know, exactly how much the same many people are around the world differences in in, 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 in in nature, I suppose, in some instances. But certainly, uh, you know, everybody has the same aspirations throughout the world. They all want to do well. They all want to be successful. They all want to be happy. And that is the inspirational aspect of, of the way we're moving at the moment. I, I think things have changed in football. I hope that, you know, recent, um, you know, events haven't altered things. And I, I would just say on the football front that, there's an issue at the moment going on about uh, all seater stadium or not. All seater stadium came in uh, after the Taylor report, after the Hillsborough disaster. And the idea was that everybody could go to a stadium safely, but it had the added effect of being a situation where there wasn't the herd um, aspect of going to a football match. You weren't with uh, a group or a mob who might have particular thoughts. Everybody was spread out around the grounds. And of course, in, in some areas of the ground as well now, there are. Um, parents and children and I think that is to a certain extent well and to, to a good extent stopped the sort of thing that we might have heard Paul would be able to answer this better than me and Stacey but uh, stop the sort of thing that we did hear uh, a lot uh, years ago when things were really really bad and I just hope that that doesn't come in again and I think you know the move away from all seater stadium for that reason is a bad thing because when you're sitting with people where the people aren't swearing if they are told to to stop swearing because there are children about or ladies about or whatever or the other way around if there are men about and the ladies are swearing uh, you know that is a uh, that is where the crowd can stop and say to people listen you're not in a majority here we're in the majority and what you're saying is wrong and we don't appreciate it so i just hope for that reason we don't get away from that i think um in terms of football, I took my niece um, to the Man City, Man United women's game last year. And there was like 31,000 people. And I felt much safer taking a child to a women's premier match than I do now at men's. Same with the boxing. The boxing mentality in the crowd has changed a great deal, which saddens me, really. In terms of role models, I think we're, we're very fortunate. Well, I'm very fortunate in both of the sports that I've had that there's been some incredible, you know, role models, obviously male mostly so far as boxers. I mean, the, one of the greatest ever, obviously, Muhammad Ali. Uh, we're not, you know, Sugar Ray Leonard. We've had in terms of uh, um, minorities, in terms of gender story obviously um the very few visible role models um in women's boxing and football when i was growing up uh literally none um and into progression um it has progressed because when i was um when i was playing football although the ban was lifted on women's football in this country in 1971 can i just say something on the back of what graham said uh, just yeah. what he just said there about he used the word the herd men mentality about fans you know now sitting down and there's a reason, you know, everyone's a little bit upset. You hear the stories now of everyone saying, like, you know, I kind of, even at Queen's Park Rangers, there was the loft, you know, and I, Manchester United was all about the strep for the end and K-stands, all the singing and all the songs. But I spent years going around all these grounds and those, those areas, different grounds had their names and everything, were the place where me and people like, you know, black people, we took a lot of their abuse. And they call it a herd mentality. It was a sheep mentality because people were saying things and they wasn't really relating to it. They wanted to be within those people and be there and be one of them. Now, I'm a East End boy. Now, when, if you're East End, you move to, say, Essex. So I'm, I'm an Essex boy. And my, the local team to me is West Ham United. Everyone supports West Ham. My mates do. I just go along as a schoolboy to watch West Ham after two games, never went back again because I was just getting dogs abuse. Even though I was still a football, I wouldn't say I was a West Ham fan as that's because I was that young. I hadn't got into it, but I was just going with my mates because I wanted to be with them at a weekend. I was getting abuse. I was getting things thrown at me. I was even getting to the point when people were urinating behind me to make a point that I was different from them. 
So that put me off of West Ham a lot, maybe when it shouldn't have done, because it was, so I didn't want to go and stand in, go and stand in those places anymore. And I didn't, didn't go because of that simple reason. So seats, seating makes a massive difference. And I totally agree. I'm pleased that it is still all seat, all seat stadiums. I'm, my, my oldest boy goes, I feel happy that he can go on his own for that reason. Thanks so much for sharing, Paul. And, and Beaky, did you have any thoughts on that, just whilst I see St Stacey's come back in so we can pop back from where we left off, but any thoughts on that, Graham, just whilst we're talking here um, about the seating um, seating situation uh, with regards to football and other, other sports, of course? Yeah, I mean, that sort of you know, behaviour is, is appalling. And, I, I, you know, I, it's a ge and as Paul has made the other point as well on that, about this being a generational thing, it's going to be a long time before... You get to people, children who live in a certain environment, perhaps at home and everything else, and you know whose friends, parents, you know, are of the same mindset. So it's going to take a, a long time for that to, to to be overcome and for people to think uh, individually for themselves. And it's only when those children grow up and gradually and very slowly uh, take on board and understand, you know, that people are different and uh, that, that they are different colours, they're different languages, different everything else, different religions, but at the same time, uh, they're all this, we're all the same, we're all the same people. And I think, you know, with, with the, the greater um, uh, influx of, of, of people on television who are a, of a different, different ethnicity, I think we're seeing now, and, and hopefully it's bringing around to people that Hey, these 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 people are okay. You know, they're, they're all right. They're, they're the same as us. They've got a sense of humour. They're good lads, or they're good girls, or whatever it might be. And so, I think that sort of thing is going to take a time to soak. And I thoroughly agree with Paul. Uh, but hopefully, it will, and and we'll get to a stage where you know we we want to be. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, very very well said in in indeed, and I think um, you know fundamentally it, it does come down to that simplicity of humanity. You know, you strip everything else away. You know, we're all flesh and blood, and we all have beating hearts and souls, and so you know, and and, and it makes me and I'm, you know, I know Stacey and I've had this conversation before. It just it makes us so angry because you just think, God, you know, you want, you know, yes, whilst I appreciate it is you know generational, and we can see there are marked differences in the generations, and people are realizing and being educated to Paul's point, people need to be educated on the fact that things like this are completely unacceptable. Things like this are, are you know, absolutely appalling behaviours and no one should ever have to, you know, suffer sitting at a game that they've gone to enjoy and, and, and you know, have, you know, someone as, as, as disgraceful as, you know, doing, you know, obscenities or whatever in, in the stands. But, um, you know, yes, it is, I suppose, improving when it comes to generations, but more can be done. And, you know, great to see that there is some kind of representation now, but at the same time, you know, Stacey, um, you know, mentioned before around the point on role models and real models, uh, you know, that there, there, there are few few around. That's not to say that there aren't role models through, you know, all, all of you here are role models, um, you know, but we all have our different ways that we relate to individuals, be it for our race, our gender, our ethnicity, you know, whatever it might be. Uh, you know, I think for, for the youth that are coming up, um, you know, it's so incredibly important for them to see that there are people who, who are in, in whichever way or form like them. Things I'd, I'd say on that, um, that, obviously I agree with everything that's been said. This is where there's a big difference though between diversity and inclusion, in my opinion. Because representation is really important, but it only goes so far. So you could have, you know, a pitch that, you know, it's got black players, brown players, white players, whatever. But if then, you know, if, if the treatment of that, you know, if someone's being blatantly racist and that isn't dealt with in a really serious way, that diversity doesn't translate to inclusion. Similarly, in boardrooms, have we got enough representation of being people in those positions of, of decision making and influencing governing bodies and the people who've you know got the power to influence these things if again even in office space this is where it relates so well to business you could have an office that has people of different genders sexualities disabilities class race whatever but if not everybody's made to feel that their voice is valued they're not comfortable sharing their sort of insight then you, you don't get to really understand what it's like for them or what their journey's been like. So I think diversity is important and it is a step and representation is massively important, but inclusion is the key that those people feel able to use their influence, able to use their voice 
And you know, that, that's, that's the bit that's different, you know, because sometimes if you are, you know, a person of color in a room or a person with a disability or a woman or whatever, and you're just there as a token, there's no power that comes with it. See, I think you've got to really give people, make them feel comfortable to use that voice. And then we can perhaps influence change if we're actually listening to the people in the room who bring those valuable insights. Mm -hmm. The second thing is, it just saddens me so deeply when we see this because I believe sports are one of the most powerful things on the planet for bringing about positive change. When we see, because it, it's so clear, it's so raw, there's so much emotion involved, it's so much in the moment, very few places in life that you get that. You don't quite get that in business or, you know, even in music, something that is a live performance. You don't get that like you do in sport, you know, the, the underdog, the unpredictability, just the raw emotion of it. So seeing people like you or, you know, seeing women, for example, who show resilience and strength and that impacts all other areas of society, how we view women in the workplace, how we, just like the Paralympics did, it changed the way that people viewed people with disabilities because they saw them doing incredible things. So that's the importance of sport. And at the grassroots level, what a difference it makes in young people's lives. You know, I work one day a week in a school and I see the difference that sport makes in lives every day. I went, when I went to the Calais and Dunkirk refugee camps doing sport with kids, loads of different languages spoken, different cultures, religions. Sport was unbelievable for bringing those children together. And you know, what a privilege it was for me to go there. And sport worked its magic even in the most dire circumstances. So to say that we don't take every single opportunity to allow sports positivity to impact other areas of society is uh, a massive, massive loss if whenever we let that happen. Mm -hmm. I absolutely concur, Stacey. And to your point on tokenism, which um, again, actually, Paul and I were speaking about this on a podcast earlier this week, is, is I think that is the fear and getting that delicate, you know, it's a delicate, delicate juxtaposition, frankly, um, between the, uh, the line of, of kind of tokenism and, and people saying, hey, we need a token you know, black person or a token um, woman, whatever, it is about the inclusivity and the belonging, because frankly, you have that diversity without the inclusion, without the belonging, without those places that people do feel welcome to be there and be present. It absolutely does not work whatsoever. Um, but no, I absolutely agree. I mean, sport is powerful. It is, you know, wins hearts and minds and, and, and buys people in such a lot. And, and you know, what, you know, you mentioned the Paralympics there, Stacey, you know, the, you know, the Rugby League World Cup, great example. You know, the Wheelchair Rugby League Cup, I mean, it's just, it's absolutely phenomenal. You see, uh, you know, women, men, boys, girls, you know, everyone, and it, I mean, it's brutal, but it is absolutely, absolutely brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Um, so, I, I mean, around this subject then of, of role models and, and, and real models and, and representation and such, um, you know, Paul, I'm going to come to you if that's okay, because I know, um, you know, at the time when, when, when you were, um, you know, working your way up in, 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 in football and, you know, becoming very fast, one of the, the, the top, top players, I know to you, uh, you know, representation to a degree didn't necessarily matter because for you it's all about the skill and that is you know absolutely what it should be about the skill but do you think it would have made a difference if there were you know say other black players or, or other um, players that, that had the resilience that you had who were out there playing and visible for you to see? I think there always was I mean I and I mean it's more about my, my parents when, when they looked at football initially when they come across from the West Indies it was all about George Best, Bob, Bobby Charlton. That, that was, that's what they looked at. They looked at, they looked at a black player, it was Pele. So my dad, who's a big, big cricket man, when it come to foot, when it come to football, he looked at West Bromwich Albion. And all of a sudden it was Cyril Regis. They were, they were the names, they were the ones that I think I kind of aspired to, the ones that I looked at, the ones that I always thought about in situations and how they dealt with it. And I still live in, live, in, live and believe, live in that world and believe that reaction is the thing that you should never, ever do. Because I, I just always believe is that they're paying nowadays good money to go and watch a game of football. They want to waste it by abusing someone because they see them as different, more for them. So the way you react actually is, is the way that you can win, a, win, a, win an argument and that is not to react. You might look at them, 
if they say something to you, you talk back to them. You don't have to be as low as them and be rude back. And what will happen is the people around will sort that situation out for you. I'm, I'm not a reactive person. I couldn't be because I was practically on my own. I had no one to go to. So when I had like the, I couldn't tell you name the stand, the whole of that main home support behind that girl where Ellen wrote, telling me that the colour of my skin wasn't embedded in the flag of this country. I couldn't react. There was too many people for me to react to. When, as I, we talked about um, a few days ago, when I got told by a fella in the stands at Barnsley how his son was going to hate people of my colour skin as well, using kind of different words, my, my answer to him was just to shrug my shoulders, really. When I got told at Newcastle by a fella in a wheelchair behind the goal, everything he didn't like about me and what he thought about my mother, my reaction could have been, could have been the lowest form. I could have reacted to where he was. I didn't. I looked at him, I shrugged my shoulders, I laughed, I carried on, picked the ball up, rolled it to Jerry Paddington, and then took a goal kick, we carried on. So that's the way I've been brought up. And when I see, and again, as I'm, we, we chatted about a few days ago, when I see football of today, footballers who are talking about walking off a field of play, it makes me, it makes me sometimes, I makes me want to cry, it gets me emotional when I, when I think about Cyril Regis, Laurie Cunningham, Brendan Batson, uh, you know, and I think about initially John Barnes when he went to Liverpool, getting abuse from his own fans. You know, um, I got letters, and I'm sorry to say this, because uh, I got letters from Everton fans before I went to Manchester United telling me reasons why they didn't want me to sign for Everton, you know, and things like that. So things don't, you know, I don't get irate, and I just want players of today to talk about it and know that things are being done, not just in the foot, not in just in football. Got to remember, there's other industries other than football in this world. Like there's an other football, there's other football um, bodies other than the Premier League as well. So we just need players to stand firm and say they win the battle by standing on the pitch and raising their game to another level. And that's the way is one way of actually moving on and taking things on further and further. And I don't just mean that about the colour of the skin either. That's in all aspects of discrimination. I, I totally agree with what Paul said. Sorry, Beaky. Totally okay. agree with what Paul said. And I think it's, uh, this is one thing that's difficult because it's, we're always put in the position of how we deal with it. Because I have this a lot of the time you know, when certain things are said about, particularly about female boxing, because boxing is one of the sports that challenges society's definition of what it should mean to be feminine almost more than any other sport. Um, and yeah, I grew up with it as a sport. My dad was a boxer, my granddad was a boxer. It's kind of second nature to me, although as much of an odd sport as it is. Um, and so, so, and the judgment is on how did that black player respond? How did that woman respond? And that's gonna happen. But it makes it really difficult when, of course, really, the conversation should be, why is that person behaving in that vile manner? But we don't end up having that conversation. We judge the people who, and we, we all take that on, you know, we should just be able to go on the pitch and play or go in the ring and box. But box, if one of us reacts in a certain way, they go, oh, look, women are hysterical. Oh, look, black players are this, that and the other. And it it's becomes really difficult. What I would say that I try and do uh, challenging things is tough because change doesn't just happen. It's not inevitable. People make change happen. But although I'm impatient for change, we also have to allow the space and time for people to evolve and culture to change. But what I think the danger is, is that internalizing of it. So for a quick example, when I got my first England call up, I got that letter. They do it by email now, but back then it was a letter. Um, and when I was 16, getting that letter with the three lions on as a kid, if it's been your ultimate dream, is just phenomenal. You, you just can't, you know, believe it. And I, I worked in a factory at the time when I was, about, I was just about to turn 17 and went to my boss and said, I need a week off. There's nothing on the rotor. And he said, what do you need a week off for? And I gave him this letter and I was just beside myself with, you know, excitement and pride as you would be. And he didn't really say much and then said, mm, you want me to give you a week off to play for a women's football team? 
I said, well, it is the England women's football team. It's the European Championships. It's, you know, oh. and I said, well, can I just take it unpaid? It means a lot to me. And he went, you know, made all these jokes and innuendos and eventually signed it. And I came out of the office feeling really small. And actually, when I played my first game for England and I was stood in the lineup listening to the anthem, it wasn't the, the dream that I thought it would be because all I could think was, well, this isn't the England football team. This is the other they're not as good as the inferior, the women's team. And, it, and now looking back, I know I can't change every person like him sat behind that desk. Paul can't change every fan who has those horrible attitudes. We can't. We just can't. But what we can do and why, you know, Paul's role is so important at mine and Beaker's and all of us is we can try and make sure that any particular young person who comes out of an interaction like that, where someone's judged them based on race or gender, whatever it might be, doesn't leave feeling ashamed of who they are. And they can actually come out and think, do you know what, that's what they think at the minute, but I can still feel proud of who I am and what I'm doing and feel valued. And that's the danger. Just because you're black or you're a woman or whatever doesn't mean you're not susceptible to taking these messages. And before you know it, you can feel not as good as, and that's a danger for young people to you know, feel like they're not as good as. And that certainly happened to me. And it took me a lot of years to understand that I was part of that process as well. And that it was up to me to feel proud of who I was, despite the, you know, not needing the validation of others and understanding people have those attitudes, but I can still feel okay with, with who I am. Sorry, BK. Uh, it's okay, not at all. No, there were some really good points. I, I think as well, what we're seeing today uh, on the television, which is that, you know, the main media that obviously people look at and, and, and listen to, I think what we're seeing is a, is a genuine reflection now of the way our society is made up in the advertising uh, that we see on the television, there are much uh, more people of different ethnicities on uh, featuring in the advertising as, as, as individuals who have probably been uh, ignored, um, you know, in the past. And people haven't just thought about it because all the people that were making the decisions were white. Uh, and there wasn't this drive towards making sure that what we see on the television is a true reflection uh, of our society and I think also you know if you have a look at Parliament now people are voting for MPs that are not of the same colour as them that are not of the same gender as them they're voting for them because they think that they can do the best job and I think in those ways we're seeing a movement towards people becoming more accepting of what's going on Paul made the point before we are moving we may be moving slowly but as sure as eggs is eggs we are moving towards an area where people if they, if they still choose to be selective about what they might want to think about or, or just, you know, turn their backs on all logic, then there's somebody out there who's making a speech in Parliament or somebody out there uh, who's doing something else, which just might uh, say to them, hang on a second, he's actually very good indeed. I understand what he's talking about. And uh, he's, um, he's somebody who I should respect if these people respect anybody. You, there are some people you'll never turn, I'm afraid. But you know the point I'm trying to make, I think. Absolutely. And it's countering those what are still age old kind of stereotypes and, and looking deeper than that. And, you know, the media has got a very, very big part to play. And I think, you know, when we talk about sport as, as being the, the fantastic kind of emotive driver that it is something that can really bind um, people together, um, you know, uh, as well, we, we should be taking taking on board the fact that actually, you know, uh, sport is, you know, it can be truly inclusive, um, but it doesn't just stop at sport. And you know, another question that I really wanted to ask was kind of around, you know, actually ageism as another form of, of diversity and inclusion. The, the education that we can give to others to be involved in sport that aren't necessarily on the pitch or in the ring, but people who are, you know, wider than that. And I think, you know, what are your what are your takes? I, I would love to know on, on whether you think you know there's representation and there is an eclectic mix of people as well who uh, work within the industry who aren't necessarily on on the pitch or or in the ring or whatever that might be. Because I think um, you know personally, and, and again this is my 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 kind of perception and my thoughts here only. But you know with sport to a degree having 
you know, somewhat of a lifespan if you are a player, um, educating the youth and educating our future leaders and the fact that there are many other routes to be involved in sport. And that doesn't necessarily just being, on, you know, doesn't mean being on the pitch. You know, I think you know, when you look at kind of media TV programs, which has got a big part, you know, to play in influencing youngsters and you look at, I don't know, Britain's Got Talent, all these kind of pieces, actually relatively few get through. And you know, I'm sure the same is true um, without being a sporting expert, the same is true for, for those youngsters that would love to be a football player, or love to be a singer or whatever, um, you know, and then having their dreams crushed because actually it's incredibly competitive. Well, do you know what? There's lots and lots of other avenues as well. And, um, you know, those avenues also can be very in inclusive. Well, you'd hope they would be inclusive. You know, but sport strikes me as one, um, you know, in specific that, that, that could, you know, I mean, is ageism, you know, potentially a problem? Is, is that, has that got a big part to play? Your I, I think again. I think again. Uh, sorry to interrupt. I think again. It's it's a question of reflecting society. It's funny, you know, when you 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 become a grandparent. Uh, I always used to think well, when people used to go on about their grandchildren, oh, I love them. They make me feel younger. This, that, and the other. Uh, that was all a little bit soppy and all you know, not quite right. But when you are a grandparent, you actually spend more time with your grandchildren than you ever did with your children because you are working hard to, 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 to feed your children and to do all the right things. But you are, and you are working long hours in my case, and, and I'm sure our other two guests the same. Uh, but at the same time, you know, it was it, now you, you're with grandchildren, they connect to you differently as well, and you're able to talk to them. And I think there is a drive in television and radio at the moment to say, We've got to attract the young viewer. The young viewer is where it's going now. We'll get on Twitter, we'll do this, we'll, we'll bung out all these older people who we've seen on the screens a long time, who are extremely experienced, and experience in this life is such an important thing, who are extremely good broadcasters. So don't throw the, the baby out with the, with the, with the water, um, because you know, there is room, obviously, for young people, the, 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 the girls that are coming on the television now, and I, I, Paul, I don't know whether you were in the same agreement, but you know, I was a little bit skeptical when they first came came on. Um, you know, ex-professional footballers, girls that have played uh, at international level, uh, but they are very good. They know what they're talking about. The vast majority of them, in my opinion, of course, um, but uh, they are very good, and they're coming in and they're doing a great job and showing you know that they have a place to play but don't necessarily chuck everybody out at the same time. I'm, um, I must, we just mentioned there, Beaky is a, yes, I'm an ex-professional footballer. And yes, when it, when it did happen, very judgmental, very judge. If I, was, if I said anything different and come out and sang all the praises, I'd actually even call myself a hypocrite, to be perfectly honest. But as you get older, they say you, you do get humble. Everything changes and, you know, you, you move on. And when you do look at it, we have to remember that the, the England women's, or women's football is a long way behind a lot of other countries, a long way. They've made, main, they've made major leaps to where they are. And just to be judged, in my opinion, I don't know how it works, on beating America, it seems that's the way it seems to become. It seems a bit harsh, really, when the Americans have been doing it for a long, long time. If we look at the facts of, our first women's game I ever saw was when I was on a pre-season tour with Queen's Park Rangers. That's my first ever time I went abroad, abroad pre-season. So that was 1987, that was. I saw women playing football in Sweden. And kind of could imagine us going there and everything as well. We looked at it and all of a sudden you could just see if you go, oh, they, oh, they're, they're not bad. And as we know, Scandinavian foot, women's football was quite strong, very good. And we're seeing that the England women's um, team have surpassed, surpassed them in that sense. They've done it really, really quick. So we know that um, America's at a level which is almost unstoppable. So there's plenty of time for, for the England's women's team to go on and for women to go and succeed in most places. And I look at it here, my wife um, runs a business. She runs it from home. Um, it's got stronger over this, over this period of time because two weeks prior they went online she's more busy now at the moment in time the shops that she normally deals with haven't been active and it's gone mental she's doing it and going and going now i know that she could walk into any anywhere in retail and she could speak and people would listen because she knows what she, what she, you know she knows her strengths her biggest issue would be 
is to be around some strong speaking fella who is judging her and the fact she's a woman rather than actually judging is she good at a job and listening to find out you know we all went and maybe you remember this as well Beaky when we were kids growing well I talk about myself when I was growing up when I looked I would judge a good footballer by the boots he was wearing so there was me wearing a pair of Woolworths Winfields which when they got what they, when they spread out I would look at his kid and he was wearing these kind of kind of Emily News Gola boots and I would go wow look at him or Beckham Bow stars I'd go wow he's a player and it's amazing how we just judge judge straight away just by looking and I'm the oh, I'm gonna say I was the worst at that the worst but now I don't just look straight away because I, I'm starting to see what's starting to think to myself what about that bit underneath because am I gonna get embarrassed here so I won't ever put myself in that position again I think um, <laughs> it's funny because I took my very first pair of football boots, what my dad bought me from Woolworths. And um, I did a, t a talk at a school last year and I was talking about my very first game. And, and after the, afterwards, when they had these questions, this little kid put their hand up and went, what's Woolworths? And I was like, oh, Jesus, I'm really old. <laughs> it was like, it's a, it's a really, really famous shop. I promise you it was really famous. And they were just like all sat there like, what, what's she talking about? And I was like, oh, Jesus. I could just come out of a time warp. But anyway, I think um, whether it's ageism or race, gender or whatever, uh, social change tends to have a, a certain pattern of uh, ridicule, discussion, and then acceptance. If you're one of the very first ones, you take most of the ridicule like Paul will have and like I, I have as a, you know, as a female footballer and, and boxer, it tends to be ridicule of what are they doing? Because it's that out of the norm that you're not supposed to be doing. It is met with ridicule because it's different and it's a bit like what are those women doing playing football or what, you know, whatever it might be. And then there's kind of the discussion. And I actually saw this when I was in America through the Obama campaign, you know, it happened politically. And I remember when he, you know, I was very fortunate to be there during such a monumental shift in their politics that when Obama first started campaigning, it was met with ridicule. Because at the time, if you, you know, you were black, it was completely acceptable to play basketball, American football, or whatever, or be a rapper. But being a politician and particularly going for president was like, What's it? And that, you know, it wasn't just the white community that was saying those things. They were all a bit like, <laughs> what's this guy doing going so far out of his lane? He was laughed at. Then when he picked up momentum and when he actually turned out to be a fantastic public speaker, loads of charisma, really personable, have some great, you know, points to make. And then it went from ridicule to discussion. And you could see the shift of people going, actually, that, that Barack guy has got some quite good. Have you seen him? Have you seen his? And you could see it and eventually go so far into acceptance that he got voted in by, by a, you know, a, a large majority twice. Um, which, and now, you know, it's changed everything. If you're a little black kid in America and you happen to say in school, what do you want to be when you grow up? President. Nobody can laugh at you now and go, what are you on about? <laughs> now, lo and behold, it's been done. And suddenly it's a bit like, well, fair play to him. Yeah, that's the difference that, that it makes. And it's, so I think with anything, you know, just like with ageism, you know, even though that, if you can see it, it can be a thing is important. Someone has to be first to do something. So if you're the, the first 90 year old commentator, there's going to be ridicule. Oh, he's dead old, is this, she's that. Da, da. But once someone's done it, then everyone else can go, well, I'm only 80, <laughs> got years in me yet, look at such a body. And you know, sport, it, it drives me mad. But what, whenever they write an article on you, it always includes your age. They don't do that with everybody else. You know, it's always, the, the 30 this year old, the 30 that, and as it's creeping up, you're thinking, right, I know, I know the clock's ticking, I know. And it's like, they always put your bloody age on everything. And when I went to Zimbabwe for the, to, for the title, I was what, 36 then, and they were going, oh, the 36 year old, like that's my only, you know, <laughs> factor. And they say, you know, she's in with a 28 year old. And I'm reading it thinking, right, you know, like they always focus on that. But I think now, you know, the, the Masters categories, my mum's an England runner for the Masters category. And I mean, you, you want to see these athletes now, men and women, running these 10Ks in sub 40 minutes and doing pole vaulting and sprinting, they're phenomenal. So I think now we're seeing a lot more the ageism and, and same as Beaky was saying, you know, we are starting to value experience, thank God. 
And, you know, right across the board with leadership, it's changing. We've always had this thing that whoever shouts loudest and says the same thing over and over again, they must be right. Well, now we're learning actually there's different types of leadership experiences being valued, insight, you know, life experience and even things, you know, not necessarily like Beaky was saying, not everyone is the best broadcaster just because they've got a degree. They might have great life experiences that lend themselves really well to interacting with other human beings, Do you know, and all of, you know, he's probably got loads more from being a quantity surveyor and doing all those jobs he did than he would have four years in the university, arguably. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I think we're valuing a lot of other skill sets that leadership can bring beyond what we used to in that very rigid view of what a leader should look like and act like. It's changing. And the, good, the, good, the good thing about radio, Stacey, as well, is they can't see your face. So if your voice is OK and you're still going, you still know a little bit about what's going on, you're OK. <laughs> Some really valuable points there, though, guys. And before, before we run out of time today, what I would love to do is, is to, well, two questions here. So, so first of all, you know, clearly we're amidst the crisis at the moment. Um, you know, we've seen a huge amount of globalization and this digital world that is flung uh, in front of our eyes right now. And obviously there's a big impact on, on that when it comes to sport. Um, you know, arguably, maybe it can make it more inclusive. Um, you know, when the, first of all, um, whilst we don't have a crystal ball, what some of the you know, key changes that you noticed or, or you think will, will be ahead of us are um, due to uh, the pandemic and also, the key moment from each of your personal careers would be, I think, a fabulous way to, to end the show for today. Because look, you've all had um, fascinating backgrounds and it's been brilliant hearing the insight from, from each of you today, but all very, very different. Um, so if we're to leave our audience with a, a, a nugget of wisdom um, to take away with them from your life lessons, I wonder whether you could also, also share that with us before we wrap up for today. Well, a key moment is, I can only say one thing, I, oh, blimey, don't know what's going on up there, um, say one thing, and that was 1990, because of, um, I always say that people had got me name, I was deemed as playing for an unfashionable club then, at that given time, even though I was a black man in blue and white hoops, so I kind of must have stood out somewhere along the line, but I represented my country in a World Cup, and after that given time, people suddenly put a face to a name. Um, I stopped my, uh, my local supermarket in Wokenham, at that, where I was living at that time. I stopped, then they had to um, shut down all of their, um, all of their um, tills, and I had to do a signing session in their um, pictures of people. At that time. Never, I couldn't, in Wokenham of all places as well, which I wish I'd have kept the house there, by the way. Gosh, that would have been something. But it was something which still, still lives me. I wish I could have had pictures taken of that moment. A black man in Wokenham had stopped the supermarket because people wanted pictures and autograph. Um, that, that was a, a major part, a, a, key, a key moment for me, a major change in my life, and things moved on from there. On changes now, I think there's just going to be a a change in, in football. When I look at football, how maybe for a long, for, think for a while, I think we might see a change in, well, a definite change in crowds. It's going to take a lot of people to tell themselves that it's okay to go and watch football. They're going to stay away. People are not going to want to be caught up in big crowds. People on travelling. I think that's going to make a, a big difference as well after this. But I think when you, when you look at it as well now, I think, Again, because I'm, I wouldn't say I'm a major fan of how it's turned out. And 1990 was one of the triggers for it starting was the Premier League. I think because of how things have been, how Premier League has been over these years, I think that people are shying away from it. I can see people stepping away from it and maybe looking lower down, lower down where the real foundation of football really is with the bread and butter people down there. I think that's, that's going to be a, my what belief in changing football. It's, it's what I'm thinking anyway. Thanks so much, Paul. And I had a great image in, in my mind there when you were explaining that, that beautiful story of being in, being in Wokingham. That's just absolutely brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. I commend you massively. Um, Beaky. 
Gosh, that's a diff difficult one because, you know, I I'm with an illustrious pair of sports people here. And a key moment to me, it's very difficult to say uh, a key moment. I think the key moment was when I got that little bit of luck. Um, I, I remember one day I was, I was painting the bathroom uh, uh, and I'm listening to the, to the local radio station, the commentary, and I'm, I'm painting away and think, you know, I could do that. I, I could, I'm sure I could do that. I'm sure I could do that as well, if, if not better than him. Um, but I didn't have the, the guts to, to go and knock on or phone the radio station up and say, here's a job. Um, and I should have done, and that's probably been one of the things that, you know, early, particularly early in my career, where I didn't push myself enough. I didn't go to people and say, um, you know, can you help me here or I can do this for you. And, and anybody out there listening to this, please, if you're even half thinking that you're going to be good at a job, don't be afraid to go and say to people or knock on people's doors or phone people up or write to people and say, I'm sure I could do this job really well and, and, and go and do it. So the key moment was probably when I got the lucky break uh, and the, all the, the, the weather was bad on Merseyside and this game on Wirral, which wasn't a great game of football, but the, the person who ran the Sunday League programme said, it doesn't matter, the editor, he said, it doesn't matter. He said, can I meet you there? And I met him there and he said, I'd like to use you. And, and I got that lucky break and I went down to, to do another game and they liked it. It was a cup game and it was a replay. So I got another chance. So that momentum went on. And then somebody else said, you know, I think you could do a job uh, doing a football game. And this is so long ago, this Paul at Southport were in the league. So uh, although I was just doing Sunday football at the moment, they wanted me to do Southport on a, on a Saturday after. I remember when my first game was Southport against Grimsby Town. And so I got that lucky break again. And then eventually being patient and perhaps I should have again earlier said, is there any chance of a, a full-time job here? But being patient, this job became available full-time and I got it and um, became eventually sports editor at Radio Merseyside and then sports editor at Radio City and then moved on uh, to freelance. So that was my key moment, a bit of luck. But, you know, if I was given the time again, I would have been forceful is the wrong word because I'm not a forceful kind of individual, but I would have been prepared to go out and say, uh, please give me a chance ahead of us. It's going to be really, really difficult. Um, you know, uh, when the first player um, goes down with uh, coronavirus, um, in the, when the, the Premier League is resumed, that is going to be really difficult because there'll be a scream and a shout for everything to stop and, 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 and no, we'll start again and it's not right and the league will be decided on this, that and the other. We'll go then to, to the next start of the next season and if we get a spike in coronavirus, which is highly likely to happen, then the league closes down again. So how are we going to happen? So we're asking people to go ahead and do the thing, which is a really, really difficult thing uh, so that perhaps we can we can carry on with life as normal. And so we're asking really for people to put their, their necks on the, on the chopping block for, for the future of football. And that's really, really difficult. And that's a difficult choice which players are going to have to make. Thanks for sharing, BK. And I, I love that you found your voice and I love that you got your confidence. And no, we mentioned this on, on our pod, podcast, obviously within our family, because I don't know whether you guys know, but, but, but Beaky's actually my third cousin. Um, so mum will be listening, will be very, very proud indeed. Oh. But, uh, but you had, if, if you Google Beaky on, on, on Google, of course, there, uh, there's a piece there that says uh, you gained legend status when you had an on-air argument with someone. And I listened to it time and time again. I was like, yes, come on, Beaky. Brilliant. So you found your voice in the end from those humble beginnings. So thank you for sharing. And Stacey? The main thing was not, probably not even a moment for me. It'd be when I took my niece to the Man United Man City women's game last year, because to be there and there'd be 31,000 people in the stadium is what I always dreamed women's football could be. Uh, similarly with watching the World Cups, you know, um, and looking at the standard now that the investment is there and seeing what an impact it had on my little niece. Cost me about a million quid in the city shop after like, because <laughs> I wanted a key ring and a ball and I'm like, well, I'm all for it, but my God, I had to, I had to like spend a load of money. But um, so the moment in football <clears throat> was that because, you know, it, it was to, to see where it's going and where it's got to. <clears throat> and my niece growing up, not knowing any different was just, just amazing. In boxing, um, as an amateur, it'd be winning the European silver medal. It's hard to put into words what it was like having been banned from the sport as a kid to then standing on that podium with a medal around my neck. Watching my country's flag be raised was just a phenomenal feeling. 
likewise making a pro debut, but obviously Zimbabwe as a professional was my highlight to win the Commonwealth title. The downside was that I didn't get a belt because there wasn't one um, for women at the time, but that's the conversation <laughs> we had and they've now created a women's title belt. And so now that's available, which is what part of paving the way is. Um, there's now that belt available for women. But um, yeah, that was obviously the, the key point for me was, you know, and becoming the first British woman to win the Commonwealth title is it's luck. It's about timing that, but I'm grateful that, you know, it, it was me that was able to do it and I'll, I'll use it in every possible way I can to make a positive difference to others, which we're all doing through sport, which is, uh, which is great. So uh, thanks for having me and thanks for everything that you're all doing. It's been, been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you all so much for being here and for sharing your stories. Honestly, it, I mean, it's been an absolute honour. And I think, you know, genuinely from the bottom of my heart, the, 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 the beautiful thing about this panel is each and every one of you have got an unwavering amount of humility and modesty, frankly, and something that I very much hope that not only the, the youth of the future, but other leaders, and like we said, Anyone can be a leader. These days, that's not reserved just for the few in the ivory towers. Anyone can be a leader. We've all got fantastic stories there. And, and I would very much hope that others um, aspire and can take away uh, a huge amount of inspiration from this conversation. I've learned such a lot just from having this conversation with all of you and obviously from knowing you all uh, individually as well. But by way of a summary, and I'm going to keep this one very, very short because I think you've all said so many brilliant things throughout today. But you know, the, the generational changes over generations, you know, some of the um, some of the great things that we have seen, you know, we must be as patient as we possibly can because things like this are not going to happen overnight. But to Stacey's point on Pave the Way, which, by the way, you absolutely should all check out Pave the Way, um, absolutely phenomenal charity. There always must be a first person. There must be a few people in the first instance. And the stories that we shared um, today, and I've been privileged to hear from all of you, are, are the fact that, you know, we've all demonstrated that huge amount of resilience, you know, often being the first second you know who are really sticking heads above the parapet to make it happen and to pave the way for our future generations of leaders and set an example you know paul you're a massive fan as you all are of education and that is where it starts it starts with education it starts with speaking out it takes people like you guys and others who are listening in to be speaking out positively about what we can do because this is not going to happen with just one person um, speaking. This is a collective effort and together I know we can make sport more inclusive. We're already seeing some great positive changes and certainly with the pandemic and the globalization that we are seeing, you know, harnessing digital tools to be able to, to make positive conversations happen. God knows there's um, enough negative media out there. We need to keep up with the positivity and keep on with the real models and the role models of course but I think real models is what it's about and you all absolutely epitomize that so thank you very very much again for being here today all of you pleasure thank, thank you, thank you. Thank my you name's all. my name's Leila Mackenzie Dallas and you've been listening to the Dial Global virtual lounge today with three fantastic panelists if you missed anything do not worry at all we're going to uh, do the work for you and put all the key pieces of information all of the all of the websites there and all of the links to all of the guys from the uh, from the panel today into the show notes at the end of today's show. You can view that on the COVID-19 Support Hub um, and on our website as well. Visit www.dialglobal.org and all the information will be there. We will look forward to seeing you again as well very, very soon.